Thank you, worship team, and good morning, church. Andrew, thank you for this invitation. It's good to be here. It's good to see some familiar faces. It was good to see Barbara. I saw on the video recording that last week she was on worship. This week she's on kids. She's working hard. Barbara, really good. She said that she will be watching online, so that's my way of kind of checking that she will. So um, if she says anything... I'll double check. Peter, it's good to have you. Peter came with me as an emotional support. Many of you might know Peter Maybury. I saw Benji Maybury. He was on the worship team last week. So you have one Maybury. We have another Maybury. So I think that's, that's, it's good to share between churches, isn't it? It's good to share. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Wukash. I'm part of the team at Hope Church. As I was chatting, um, this is my fifth year in the borders. I lived for a few years previously in England. I know the foreign land. And English people in the church? <laughs> Reveal yourself. Oh, good. I see that. If English people are welcome, then that's a healthy church. That's a healthy church. Now, well, it's good to be here. So fifth year here in the borders. And I'm employed as a youth worker. But because it's a small church, I've been on the eldership team for a few years. Michael, who many of you know, did something called the apprentice elder. So he invited some of the younger guys on the eldership team, and I was one of the guys who stayed on. So that's what I do. I'm also engaged. I'm engaged to a beautiful lady, Lauren, a beautiful woman of faith, getting married next year, and the borders will be our home. So hopefully you'll meet her one day. Hopefully you will. So I think that's that's, that's all you need to know about me. If you want to learn more, come and speak to me. Come and speak to me. Because we are continuing in the series, Jesus Manifesto. Jesus Manifesto. I watched the service from last week, and it was encouraging to hear about John the Baptist and him being in prison and the real struggle of faith that we sometimes have. I think we all end up in the place every now and then when we question. I myself been there a few times, I'm a Christian of 10 years only, but I had moments when I just stood there and thought, Jesus, are you really the one? Are you really? I know I put my faith in you, but are you, are you the one? Are you the one? And I know he always came through for me. So I would like to comment on the text. It's a beautiful text. Thank you for giving me this passage. I'm so honored because it's one of the scriptures that are so close on my heart, so close on my heart. But a question needs to be asked. Who is Jesus? Because he's the, he the person who will share some challenging words, as he always does in the scripture. But who is Jesus? If I went around the room, if I went around the room and asked each of you, what would you say? Who is Jesus? I think if each of us had a go, then we would get the full picture of who he said he was, who the Father said he was, and who other people said he was. But can I ask a few of you, and could you give me, Andrew, can you give me just one word answer? Who is Jesus to you? Jesus. Yes. Uh, he's, my, my savior. he's your savior. <coughs> the one through whom you have the relationship with God. Thank you. Peter, how about you? Who is Jesus to you? Everything. Everything. Claire and Frank, it's good to see you at the back. Frankie, who is Jesus to you? He is a bread to be eat. Yeah, love that, love that. And with hope, youth. Sorry, I'm a youth worker. Okay, so apologies for engaging you. Okay, it's not gonna be that easy. Okay. We say that every week at Hope Hope Youth, we develop this way of starting to talk about Jesus, and we say that Jesus was the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and then I ask the next person to add a bit, and the next person to add a bit more. So we say Jesus was the Son of God the Lamb of God who died for us on the cross, then he was buried, then after three days, God raised him from the dead. He's alive and active, sitting at the right hand of God, watching telly and eating what sits. No? What is Jesus doing? He's interceding. He's praying for us. I just loved how we prayed for the churches in the borders and the Baptist churches and other churches. Do you know that Jesus is praying for us? He's your prayer warrior. There were a few people that I asked to be praying for me as I was preparing for this Sunday. 
But Jesus is also praying for me, he's praying for you as a church. Isn't that something to be encouraged by? Jesus, the prayer warrior. So sitting at the right hand, praying, interceding for us, preparing a place for us, and one day he will return to judge the living and the dead. And I always say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So that's something that I like to set the scene because it's so easy to forget. We all have lives. There is various aspects of Jesus, but I, I like to remember those key informations. It's not all, but these are the key moments to me that we remind ourselves. So that's the Jesus in the Bible who is speaking in the story. And as he often did, the religious leaders will be a bit upset with Jesus. I say Arthur Hamblin, who is a Bapt was a Baptist minister, well, still is, he's a great friend of mine. So if I say anything that you might have questions, please speak to Arthur, okay? Arthur will sort me out. And I lived with Arthur for a year, so we are really good friends. So if I say anything questionable, speak to Arthur. He will sort me out. Well, he certainly will, and his wife will, Maya, they will sort me out, they will. So let me start by verse 36. So the scene is that Jesus was invited by the Pharisee to share food with them. Last evening, Peter and I, we were in Selkirk at the Indian place. Johnny Watson, some of you know Johnny Watson, he invited us for dinner. So we had tea with Johnny Watson at the Indian restaurant, and it was such an intimate moment. Even though there were other people around, we, the three of us, we shared food. We had conversations together. I wasn't looking around at anybody else. I was with the two guys. We were chatting, we were eating. We had a really good time together. And that's the kind of scene that Jesus was invited into, to share some food at someone's house. And he reclined at the table, and there was a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. That was very interesting to me, that she had the label of a sinful woman. And I'm wondering if you have any labels, maybe good or bad. Maybe you're English or Scottish. Maybe there are good past and good moments in your life. Or maybe you had some challenges with the law, with, with sin, with something that you were exposed to. And maybe you have some labels that are on your, maybe there are labels you put on yourself. I myself is the biggest critic sometimes, and I know that there are labels I put on myself. Is there any labels that you have on your life? Because there are also labels that God wants to put on our lives, the good labels, the good truths about our life. But this woman had a label. Maybe you look at me. What do you see when you look at me? Do you hear my accent? Do you see my age? Do you see... Oh, I hope that you like the accent, though. It's a Scottish accent, gala accent, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what do you see? Maybe my age? I'm 26, so I'm really young. I'm six foot tall, would you say? Yeah, I'm six foot plus tall. I'm young, I'm smiling. I'm a little bit nervous, but I say that's good because that means that it's important what I'm doing. What do you see? Or do you maybe see that I'm a son of God, that I'm a servant of Jesus, that I'm his child? What labels do we see? So she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And that's why I wanted us to remind ourselves of who Jesus was. I know we did that through songs, and that was just an addition. Because this woman, she saw something in Jesus. We will later learn that the Pharisee, he thought that he was a prophet. But this woman, she said to herself, and it reminds me of the other lady in the, in the Bible, when she said to herself, if I touch Jesus, I will be healed. And this woman, she had to say to herself that Jesus was someone more. I don't think the text reveal much what she thought exactly. Maybe she thought he was the Messiah, maybe the prophet, maybe a healer, maybe a restorer. I don't know what stories she heard about Jesus, but she heard something that made her made her faith just come alive, and she, and she came to the house where Jesus was with an alabaster jar of perfume. Yesterday, Peter and I, we were in Edinburgh. We, as the church, are on the end of our week of prayer and fasting, and we went to Edinburgh with our hub of churches from south of Scotland to spend some time together and to pray. 
and a newly formed church from West Lovian, they were also saying that they have 70 people in the church, and 30 of those people are children. <laughs> and they were saying how unique that is and the dynamic of the church is so different with having children there. And we were just praying and thanking God for the children in their church. And let me just say how amazing it is that God blessed you with children. And one of the Scottish leaders that came forward, he prayed for the children and he kind of noted that, that back in a the day there was a prophetic word shared that God will do something in this nation through the children. And they were praying for the children. And I would like to just thank God that he's doing something in your church as well. I know through the holiday club that I was part of last year, he's bringing children to your church. I know it's maybe not what you are praying for, maybe not what people normally expect when they think of church growth, but God has blessed you with children. And yeah, I thank God for that. But they are on a day in the West Slobian surf in a very rough part of the area on council estates so on. And what I learned that people who see their immediate needs and come to Jesus, they often come to Jesus at first with the best gifts. This woman came with a jar of perfume, expensive perfume. That's what I learned, that people that have nothing to offer to Jesus, they, or feel like they have nothing, they will bring their, the best they have to begin with. They will just bring their best finances, their best involvement, their best time. They just offer everything. And she stood behind at his feet. My fiance, Lauren, I said, Lauren is from England. She was born in Mosley in Birmingham. She's now in Stevenage for the weekend. Her older daughter, daughter, sister lives there. She just had a baby, it's good, I'm not a daughter. <laughs> She's never been married, okay? It's our first relationship. Lauren is down in Stevenage and she sent me a photo yesterday. So her two sisters and Lauren, they are staying at her older sister's house. And they had a spa night, okay, spa night. So they had some like face masks on and she sent me some selfies with like avocado paste on and, and they were doing some like, I don't know what it's called, like feet peeling or something, feet massage and applied some lotions and stuff. Don't ask me, I'm not very good with that. But, but she sent me this one photo, right, when her older sister Dion, in her 30s, accomplished woman, great Christian woman, professional lady, she was on her knees washing her feet in the basin. And then I was reminded, wow, what a beautiful picture. This older woman is washing <laughs> the feet of the younger one and she's serving her. She invited her into her house. She put the face mask on for her. She fed her. And now she's washing her feet and doing all the treatment. I was like, that's, hum that's humility. That's very humbling of her. And I see this woman her humility, repentant heart, on her knees at Jesus' feet. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. Now we know that Jewish women, they would have their hair covered. My next door neighbors are Muslim and I know that when I knock at their door, they often bring me food, I cut the grass, we have this arrangement so we help each other. And when I knock at the door to bring the plate back from the lovely food that they've given me, the women always cover their, their hair. So it was unusual, wasn't it, at the Pharisee's house, a sinful woman come and bow at Jesus' feet. She had to see something more in him. She uncovered her hair. Maybe she came in this way. Maybe she uncovered it to wipe it down. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it shows you that this level of desperation. She was hungry. She was hungry. It's interesting that God feeds the hungry and he satisfies the thirsty. It's something about the responsibilities of us as Christians that we need to be thirsty. We need to be hungry. I had the water bottle yesterday at the church in Edinburgh and I was refilling the water bottle throughout the day and I was just sitting there and thinking and I was praying to God to make me a fountain of living water, first for myself and then for others to share. And I was looking at this water bottle and I heard these words in my heart, maybe from God, maybe my thoughts, I don't know. To ask God to fill this water bottle, it was half full. And I said, God, fill this water bottle with water. 
I opened my eyes, and the bottle wasn't filled, right? So the, there was no miracle, sorry. So I looked at this bottle, and I thought, hmm. And then I heard the Holy Spirit saying to me that the water is there in the tap where I've been taking the water from. The source, there is plenty of water at the source, but I need to come whenever I'm thirsty to the source. There is no limit. I can take as much as I want. Whenever I'm thirsty, just come and take. And what I learned with us as Christians is that we need to come to God daily. Is this daily bread. Like when the Israelites, when they went through the desert, they could gather the manna, and when they tried to store it, what happened? What happened when they tried to store it for the next day? Exactly, it went bad, it didn't work, it, it got rotten and spoiled, and, and it was good for nothing. And I learned that in my Christian life, it's good to be hungry, it's good to be thirsty daily. I don't always feel this way, it's a discipline, it's something that you learn, but that's our res responsibility. And this woman, I think, pleased Jesus. This is my theory, I don't know if it's true or not, but my theory is that Jesus was walking throughout, through his days, looking for people of faith, not people with needs. There were many people that had needs and at often times he would go to them and he would send his disciples and it's a good thing. But I see or I feel like Jesus was pleased with people who came to him with faith. Sometimes this desperate faith, this bottle half full and saying, Jesus, you're the source. You can fill my bottle. So I love how she came. And then the Pharisee who invited him said to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would know who was touching him. So it's interesting that he was thinking of Jesus as a prophet, this woman as someone more. Then Jesus told him this story, a beautiful story. I will just paraphrase it. This beautiful story that someone owed God, let's say 500 pounds and 50 pounds. Neither of them had the money to repay and he forgave the debts of them both. And I love the ending, that those who are forgiven little, love little. Those who are forgiven much, love much. And if you allow me, can I ask you a question? How much have you been forgiven? Do you know that you've been forgiven? I know that most of you do, but how much have you been forgiven? Little or much? And when Jesus asked him, yeah, who do you think will love, them, love him more? The one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And then Jesus turns to him and says, this woman, she treated me the right way. She, she served me just like you. When I came through the door, there was someone to welcome me. There was someone to offer me a drink, to show me to my seat, to just look after me. Andrew gave me some information. Some of you came and said, hello, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. That made me feel really just welcomed here. So I do appreciate that. And Jesus was saying that, and I'm no one special. <laughs> I'm one of you. I'm, I'm, I'm no one special. But Jesus is Lord. He is the Lamb. He is the Son of God. And it shows you that this, this woman saw something more in him. The Pharisee, I'm not so sure about. So, Jesus' manifesto. My thoughts took me and my prayer time to forgiveness. You know, Jesus wants to forgive us. And we believe in forgiveness. And there are three responses that I had on my heart. <sighs> three responses. And I was inspired by the children's story, actually. So I watched the service online, as I said. And, and last week, during the children's time, a question was asked. The question was this, do you think that we can manage to rob out other people's mistakes when they do them against us. What would you say? Yes or no? Can we rob out other people's mistakes? I think we can, can't we? Through Jesus, by his grace, we can. I added two questions. Do you think God can rob out other people's mistakes when they sin against him? or against us. We know that through Jesus, as we sang, his blood washes and cleanses us from every sin. And I like this passage from John, that God is faithful and just. And if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and he will forgive us and clean us from all unrighteousness. And furthermore, last question I ask, do you think that God can rob out 
your mistakes when you sinned against him, others, or yourself? You know, can you, can you accept the forgiveness from God, but also forgive yourselves? And the prayer that was prayed was this, please help us to forgive others and rob out their mistakes that they make against us. Amen. Would you say amen in your heart? Amen. God help us. Three things. I would encourage you, because who, who am I to tell you how to live? I'm on the journey myself. I'm on the journey myself. But I would encourage you, as this building, as this space, I was here last year helping at the holiday club, and you had different colors on the wall and different carpets. You freshen it up. What I learned in my young Christian life, that as we go along, things stick to us. Sometimes it's a sin, and I hope it's something small in your life, because what I learned, there's no need to wait until things get bigger. As soon as the small things come up, let's confess them to God. Let's ask for his forgiveness, and he is just and faithful to forgive and clean us from all unrighteousness. And I like what someone said about about that, that to ask Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, to tell us. Because when we do the process of self-examination, don't know if you try, but the more I do it, the more displeased with myself I am. But when I ask the Holy Spirit, someone said, and I think it's true, that the Holy Spirit tells us what we did wrong, how to make it right, and how to move on. I understand that there are certain sins and issues that need counseling and need some time and process to go through, but most things can be dealt with this way. So let's don't examine ourselves too much, but a little bit of that is needed to freshen up and clean up. Second response, and I owe you. I heard that once in a teaching. I went on the internet and I googled, so I used some internet, okay? What an I owe you is, and the Google said, is a written acknowledgement of debt that one party owes another. A written acknowledgement of debt one party owes another. And I wonder if that's something you could consider doing when you go back home. Maybe there is someone that you can forgive to, today. Maybe there is someone from your past, from your family, maybe one of your parents that you might have something to forgive from. Maybe one of the people from your church, maybe the leadership team. I've been in the borders for five years. I'm young, but I'm not a fool. And I understand that between churches sometimes, things weren't done the right way. Maybe there's something to be forgiven for us as Hope Church, which I do apologize if, if you wronged you in any way. And I wonder if that's something we could do when we go home to write the debts that people owe us. And as we say in the Lord's prayer, Lord, forgive us our debts as we are forgiving, as we for, forgiven our debtors. If you could do this, this act, this sac, not sacrament, that's, that's um, sacraments are much more than that, but this act, this physical act of writing maybe this person's name that you need to forgive or something that they've done to you and maybe tear it, tear it up or take a candle and burn it or put it in the fire lock if you have and just have it as an act of, Lord, I forgive them. I release them. And I'm sure that you heard that someone said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison hoping the other person to die. So what I'm saying, I don't want to mess with your business, but what I'm seeing in the text that forgiveness is in Jesus' heart. Jesus' manifesto, forgiveness was important to him. He died for us that we might be forgiven. And, and, and he said, go and forgive others. So it was important to Jesus. So. I would encourage us, even as we worship, to ask God to maybe remind us of something we need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe we can go back home and write the IOUs, tear them up, give thanks for that person. And if you have some deep issues, some deep challenges, deep unforgiveness, I would encourage you to speak to Andrew and just go through some counseling. Come to the prayer team and ask them to walk with you through that, because I understand some wounds go deeper than just a simple prayer and writing it down. So I wonder if that could be our response from the text. Because Jesus said, it's not enough to listen to what I say. I want you to be doers of the word. I want you to listen 
and to apply. Do you think we can do that? Thank you. And the final response for here and now, I wondered if we could praise and give thanks to God because we were forgiven much. And I wonder if, do we have a song after that? Yes, if we could pray and give thanks to God during that time, sing, as I say to young people, like our lives depend on it. Sing like we were forgiven much, not to us, not to the worship team, but to Jesus. And then as we go, we are forgiven much, so let us love much. Amen? Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, God. I might maybe pray just quickly as we go. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. Such a mystery to me it is as a young person that forgiveness was so important to you, Lord, so dear to your heart. I ask, Father God, would you reveal to us the meaning of forgiveness in our hearts? What, what, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? How much, it, how much you value for us to be forgiven and us to forgive others? And Lord, I ask for grace for myself and for all of us to come to you with repentant hearts and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Show me the way forward. Show me how I can make things right. And help us to move on, Father, in serving you. And God, as we go home, maybe there are things we can, we need to sit down and write down and think of people that wronged us, that owe us. Give us the grace, Holy Spirit, to do that. Because in our strength, we might not be able to. But in your strength, by your grace, everything is possible. So I ask for the grace for all of us. And Lord, this morning is for your glory. So be glorified through this time, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.